Before you start any electrical work, the first question you should ask is, can we de-energize the equipment first? Remember, hazard elimination is always the safest bet. If you can, great. Just be sure to follow the proper lockout tagout procedures. That means making sure everyone knows when lockout tagout procedures are being used, testing the equipment to make sure it's really de-energized before starting any work, and allowing a standardized process to account for everyone involved before restoring the power. These procedures could get complex depending on the system and number of workers, so we won't go into every detail here. Just know that de-energizing and using lockout tagout procedures are hands down the safest measures when it comes to working on electrical equipment. But de-energizing isn't always possible for a number of reasons. Maybe you're working on critical equipment at a hospital or chemical plant where downtime would lead to its own serious risks. If for whatever reason you aren't able to de-energize the equipment, you'll need to fill out an Energize Electrical Work Permit and get it approved before any work can be done. You could find an example of what one of these permits look like in the NFPA 70E, but it should cover things like the work you'll be doing, justification for not de-energizing the equipment, the results of your shock risk and arc flash risk assessments, and the controls you'll be putting in place to reduce those risks. It's important to re-emphasize that only electrically qualified workers are allowed to work on live equipment. Once your work permit is approved, a qualified person should put together a written job safety plan and job briefing for everyone involved. Again, the NFPA 70E has job safety planning and briefing checklists in its annexes. Generally, these should cover a breakdown of the job tasks so everyone's on the same page about the work that needs to be done, the results of both electric shock and arc flash risk assessments so everyone knows what the risks are, the controls you'll put in place based on those assessments, like your approach boundaries, required gear, and tools, and your emergency response procedures, so your team knows what to do in case something goes wrong. Once everyone's clear on all the above, you can start putting in place the safety measures you've outlined. This is where you'll mark the limited and restricted approach boundaries and the arc flash boundary. You should clearly communicate these boundaries to anyone who might be working nearby. That could mean taping off the areas or using non-conductive barricades to make sure no one accidentally enters the area. And don't forget proper signage. If there are unqualified workers nearby, a qualified attendant should also monitor the boundaries to make sure no one accidentally crosses them. And if an unqualified worker absolutely needs to pass through a limited access area, then the attendant should inform them of the risk and continuously escort them through. Lastly, it's time to make sure everyone's geared up with the right PPE and tools. Check everything to make sure there's no wear or tear or damage that could affect your safety. With your boundaries in place, an attendant to enforce them, and everyone wearing the right gear, you're finally ready to do the job, and safely.